Uh, hi, good afternoon, everyone. This is Rajiv S. Khanna from immigration.com. The Law Offices of Rajiv S. Khanna, PC. Uh, this is our Thursday community conference call, which is always at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Once it is on our private conference bridge, which is where you are right now, 202-800-8394. 202-800-8394. And uh, the other week, other Thursday, it is on LinkedIn audio. So just follow me on LinkedIn um, or hang out with me on LinkedIn. Um, we'll talk about um, any immigration questions you might have. I remind everyone that when you logged in, you heard certain disclaimers. This call does not create an attorney-client relationship, nor can we assure accuracy of the information presented. We do the best we can. Uh, so use the information cautiously. Now, um, I'll be starting in just a few more seconds the conference call based upon the questions that have already been posted in our forums. On our private bridge, we uh, start with the questions posted on the forums. And I will invite you um, in between to raise your hand if you have a question, uh, a follow-up question. Um, that will be done by you pressing star 5 on your telephone. I note that today's date is January 4th, 2024. This is the first call of uh, the new year. I wish everyone a happy, prosperous, healthy new year. Good to see you all. Uh, we'll be starting in about 30 more seconds. I am just setting up my... Uh, actually, the record recording is already on. Sorry. So this call is being recorded. Uh, anything you say here will be publicly disseminated. So if you want to conceal your identity and not reveal your name and all, that will be fine. In fact, I recommend that you do that. Okay, so it is now 12.30 p.m. Um, Eastern Time. Let me get started with the questions that have been posted. The call is being recorded, so you'll be able to see this recording later also. I'm first going to go to those questions which I have marked as frequently asked questions, okay? So let's see. Can I hold two full-time IT jobs on H4 EAD? Okay. So a lot of people have asked me about the limits of H4 EAD. What can I and can, can I not do when I have on H4 EAD? The interesting thing is people on H4 have far greater rights than people on H1, okay? So on H4 EAD, you can pretty much do anything that a green card holder can do. You can start your own business, even hire people. You can work one job, two jobs, 10 jobs in any field. Even if you're an IT professional and you want to work at a gas station, that's your call, okay? And also remember, you don't have to work. If you don't feel like working, you don't have to work. Unlike H-1B, where you are constrained to one employer, one location, as an H-4 EAD holder, you don't have to be constrained to any location. You can work in Arkansas, California, Pennsylvania without any further documentation. So you can see that an H-4 EAD uh, holder has far greater rights than an H-1B holder. Anyone has a follow-up question on what I just talked about, please press star 5 on your phone. No new questions. Any follow-up question on what I just talked about, press star 5 on your phone, please. Okay. Let me go on to the next question I have marked as a frequently asked question. So this is a frequently asked question about transitions from H-1B job loss to B-2 status and impact on future H-1B employment. I've talked about this many times before. This is a frequently asked question. I'll repeat it again. When you go from H-1B to B-2, because your grace period is getting over, you've not been able to find a job yet. This is the scenario. If you file your B-2 within 60 day grace period, and as long as the application reaches the government, the UCS, USCIS within 60 days grace period, you can continue to stay in the United States 
unless the application is denied. So let's say you ask for six months on the B2 application, the I-539, you can continue to stay if the case stays pending for six months. But make sure before the six months are over and you still haven't found a job, go ahead and file an extension of the B2 while the first one is still pending. Okay, All this information is available on my blog on immigration.com. So go to immigration.com. On the top ribbon, you see Rajiv's blog. Click on that and you will see a detailed entry about what how you should file your B2 application. Okay. I also want to add one more point. When does your grace period begin? Does it begin when you stop working or does, you, does it begin when the pay period um, or the paycheck covering the pay period ends? So the answer is the pay period ending. So let's say you're getting your full salary till March, but you stopped working in February. Your grace period will begin when the pay period ends. Okay, that's another thing to remember. Now, the last part, what if, if, what if I find another job? Okay, so remember, this is the rule for every visa in this country. You cannot transfer from status pending to status. What does that mean? Let's say you applied for your B2 but then within 60 days, you were also able to file your H-1B with another employer. Now you are going from H-1B status to H-1B. It will be approved within USA, no problem. But what if you filed your uh, H-1B, second H-1B on the 80th day, 20 days after your 60-day uh, grace period expired, you no longer have an H-1B. You are in B-2 pending um, status, we can call it that, it's not really status, it's called authorized period of stay. So normally in these cases, government will say, okay, here is your H-1B, but because you filed it after your 60 days and your B-2 is not yet approved, you are in suspense status, we cannot give you H-1B within USA. If you have an existing visa stamp on your passport, travel to the border, come back with the old H-1B visa and new H-1B approval. That's fine. If you don't have a visa stamp, go to any of the neighboring countries, get your H-1B visa and come back. So that's the that's the most that can happen. Okay. So that covers the entire situation with the B-1, B-2. Let me see what the question asked here was. H-1B was approved last year. Visa stamping is incomplete. I got laid off. I cannot secure a new role with rule within 60 days. I'm considering changing to B2. However, since my H1 visa is not stamped, is that a problem? Well, it should not be a problem as long as you have a change of status. So if you got your F1 to H1B change of status, you're fine. Whatever I said applies to you. And when I land a new job um, returning from B2 H1, would that be issue because the visa won't be stamped? Visa stamping is not an issue. The general rule is when you are inside the USA, we don't care about your visa stamping. We only care about your I-94. As long as that is valid, you're okay. All right. Now, uh, if anyone has a follow-up question on this, press star five. No new questions, follow-up question. Okay. I have one from area code. 945, I don't know where that is from. Uh, 945, where are you calling from, sir? Hello, Rajiv, sir. Uh, happy New Year. I'm calling from South Carolina. Haji, Tarunji. Uh, happy New Year to you as well. Tell me, how can I help you? Thank you. So you already addressed uh, the answer in this very question. I just want to confirm that, uh, as you said, like if it is filed, even if your B2 is pending and if you get a new job, and your new H-1B is just filed within 60 days, you don't need to step out, correct? You do not, if it gets filed within 60 days. In fact, if I represented somebody in your situation, I would, even if we, if I filed it after 60 days, I would request that these are extraordinary circumstances beyond your control, so the government should give you an H-1B within USA, and they might. 
at least it's worth a shot. Worst case scenario, they'll say, no, no, we'll give you the H-1B, but go get a visa stamp. So why should I, why should I concede the battle without even fighting, right? So I would at least ask for it. Got it. Got it? But but my second question is, sir, like if you go outside of USA, mm -hmm. so do you have to uh, wait for your H-1B approval for the second job in order to come back? Yeah. So what you would do is, this will be the sequence of events. You already have a B-2 pending. Okay. So you apply okay. for your H-1B, ask for H-1B um, within USA. And if they decline, and do it okay. premium processing. If they decline it, okay. I would just travel to a neighboring country get an H-1B stamping done, withdraw my B-2 and come back using the new stamp with the new approval, which is the H-1B approval. So you can't get a visa without the H-1B approval. So I do have a stamp from my last employer. Ah, then, you can, know, like, then, uh, you can, then you can, all you have to do is take the new H-1B approval, go outside USA, okay. turn right back, come to the border, Show them the old visa and the new approval and they should let you back in with extension of status all the way to the approval uh, I-94. So that means they will still process my H-1B approval, but they will, since I will be in pending status, that's why I was not able to change it completely to H-1B back. So I just have to step out and come back. That do is right. Do any, that is uh, right. Mm -hmm. do, I need, do, I, do I need to do withdraw any application? Yeah, the B, you should just... you should withdraw the B two once you get your H one approval. Okay. Okay. Technically, if you leave USA while the B two is still pending, it is automatically revoked. But you should just withdraw it no, anyway okay. because government screws up all the time. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, sir. You are very welcome. Okay. So. Uh, pretty soon, in a few minutes, I'm going to lock the conference because I want to make sure people who are already here get their questions answered. So we'll not be admitting new people, okay? I'll just give it another 5-10 minutes. Let me see. Is there any other frequently asked question? Oh, another. Uh, oh, yeah. The national interest waiver criteria. So this question was posted here and... Um, Interestingly, I had told the Economic Times that I'll give them an article on NIW. I'm actually writing that article now and I should be able to complete it over the weekend. So you'll see the article in print um, probably next week. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time answering this question, um, but I'll take a quick look at it. I'm wondering how difficult is it to get an EB2 NIW with just bachelor's exceptional ability. So it is possible. We do it all the time. So if you have a bachelor's degree with five years of experience, that qualifies you. Okay. So six, I'm doing an internship as an undergraduate and also as an exceptional ability individual, not just five years of experience. Even if you had no degree, but you have exceptional um, qualifications, which are listed on the USCIS website, we could use those. You know, the, what you need to know is, and I'm, that's why I'm writing this article, NIW is a very weird bird. It is not so much based upon your qualifications as it is based upon your dreams. What do I plan to do? Okay, to give you an example, I have a um, client from Pakistan who's getting his PhD from a third country. I don't want to give too many facts because I don't want to identify him. And he has a um, offer from a university in the United States to work in his field, which is very important to the US. So even if he didn't have a PhD, he had only a master's degree, he would have still qualified for this because the work that he's going to do when he comes to USA is very important for the US. Okay. So it's the project that we focus on. What do you intend to do? And wait for my article. Um, in fact, if you want to look at the other articles or the comments I've written, just uh, Google my name, Rajiv S. Khanna, uh, space Economic Times, The Economic Times. You'll see my page. And I, I try to write, whenever I see an issue develop, I try to write about it. Uh, sometimes I'm a little lazy or too busy. 
uh, but I do, I am going to publish this next week. So you can take a look at it, okay? Um, let's see if there's any other frequently asked question. Here's another one. H-1B laid off grace period, last employment date, health insurance and legal stay during change of employer. So there's a bunch of questions here. Some of them I've covered several times, but I don't mind doing it again. So my last date of employment was date X, but my last paycheck was date Y. When does the grace period begin? So the grace period begins when the last pay period covered by the paycheck is over. So if you get a paycheck in February and it covers you from March to April, your 60 days will begin in April, even though you stopped working in Feb in January. So you stopped working in January, got a paycheck that covers February and March, your 60 day will begin in April. Okay, so just keep this in mind. Let me just um, lock the conference. Give me one second. The conference is now locked. Yeah, I just want to make sure that I cover everybody who's here. All right, so that's the first part. Second question is, is it mandatory to have health insurance during the grace period? No, not at all. It is not required by law, but if you need it, there's something called COBRA, C-O-B-R-A, like the snake. So you might be entitled to COBRA protection. You can look into that. If you want health insurance, you can pay for it yourself, but it's a much lower price than what you would pay if you bought it yourself. Uh, third question, if H-1B change of employer is filed during the grace period, but then the grace period ends, is it legal to stay in the U.S.? Oh, absolutely. Not only that, once, if you file within 60 days, right, you can start working as soon as uh, the papers are received by the USCIS or receipted by the USCIS. So that means not only can you stay, you can even start working. Yeah, no issue at all. Uh, does anybody have any follow-up question on this? Press star 5 if you do. All right. So this one is from area code 774. Uh, where is 774? It is Massachusetts. All right. Uh, 774, go ahead, please. Hi, Rajiv, sir. Uh, my name is Ishan. Yes, sir. So this is regarding the X and Y uh, question, the first you answered. Right. So when you said about the pay period, so uh, does that mean the the pay cycle mentioned on the pay stub? Yes, exactly. So what does pay period covering actually mean? Yeah, that's that. the paycheck will say, this is your pay from this date to this date. Okay. So for example, uh, there is a situation, uh, the the last employee uh, employment date was 31st of October, mm -hmm. but the pay cycle was from 23rd of October till 5th of November. Yeah. So your 60 and days will pay begin. Check was received. Your 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 your. The amount was. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, sorry. So the amount was received in the account on 14th of November. No, no. So the paycheck says it covers you till X date of November. What was the November date? 5th of November. So your your uh, 60 days begins one day after that, which is 6th of November. Not the date you received okay, the payment, so, uh, but the paycheck coverage okay. of that period. So, so that means from, if we calculate from 6th of November, so 60 days will end on 6th of January. I haven't done the math. I'll take your word for it. The way you count it, as far as I remember, <coughs> you exclude the day on which this happened. So you start counting from the day after, which is 6th, and you include the last day, the 60th day. Okay. So okay, when sense. you begin your countdown, you'll say, when you say 1, the 1 will be November 6th, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and the 60th day will be the 60th day. You count the 60th day and in. And severance does not come under that, right? Yeah, that's a very complicated question. You know, I've had this discussion with legal scholars, my friends, um, other lawyers, and I'll tell you this, nobody really knows the answer to that question. 
the way I advise people Because. is, I would only argue, uh, first of all, if the severance includes the whole pay, I would argue I'm protected. Uh, but if the severance does not include the whole pay, I, I don't think I can argue that this is the entire pay. Okay. However, if so I'm pushed into a... Go ahead. Sorry, sir. You can go ahead, sir. Oh, so, if I'm pushed into a corner, you see, I, I am not a I'm not a professor. My job is to protect people practically, not to debate the law. So, if I'm pushed in a corner, I would argue, hey, this is pay. Where does it say that he has to receive his whole pay? When you gave your policy statement, you just said the pay period. So, I would argue for that, but I would also prepare you to leave USA for a visa stamping. Uh, okay, so it's not the end of the Please. world. Uh, your lawyers should be able to manage the situation. Make sure you have a full discussion with them. If we are in an aggressive posture, I would argue even severance pay is included. But if it is just regular amount of pay, no doubt it is included. Yeah, because when asked uh, to the company attorney, mm -hmm. like what would be the grace period? from mm -hmm. starting from mm -hmm. then they came back stating that uh, it will include the severance uh, pay date as well which no was that's not that's not true that, that's not true because they don't understand that's um, not true, right? they don't understand uh, that this is a weird situation there is actually a ruling from us department of labor in another context where they said well we don't consider severance to be a part of the regular pay okay so I would be careful with making that argument, but if I had to make it very aggressively, I would. Okay. Right. And then there is another last question. So what if there is a termination letter provided by the organization? That doesn't matter. That, uh, all that doesn't matter. Last day was October 31st. That doesn't that matter. That doesn't matter, right? That doesn't matter. Okay. okay. So the, everything that matters is the last day of the pay cycle. Last day of the pay cycle. Perfectly stated. Yes, sir. Okay. All Thank right. you so much. You're welcome. All right. So now let's see. Do we have anybody else? So once again, yeah, we have one more person from Texas. Uh, I remind everybody: no new questions, only um, follow-up questions. Well, let's see. Uh, this is, I guess, area code nine seven nine. Let me double check. Hold on one second. I'm having a little trouble with this um, dashboard, so forgive me if, if I sound a little bit lost. 979, yes, that's it. Yeah, area code 979, Texas. Go ahead, please. Uh, hello, Rajiv Ji. Uh, as you mentioned about the... <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, I can. Yeah, uh, as you mentioned about uh, the, uh, the receipt notice, like you can start working for the employer mm -hmm. when the H-1B transfer is filed within the grace period mm -hmm. or... You are not required by law, right? You're not required. You have the option but not uh -huh. the obligation to uh -huh. start working. Okay, okay. So, uh, my H-1B transfer request was filed in April and mm -hmm. recently it got approved. Mm -hmm. So, in the meantime, uh, if I change my address, was I required to uh, report the change of address? Uh, because I didn't do that. Okay. Uh, so, the law is... Yeah. Until you become mm -hmm. a U.S. citizen, even as a green card holder, every time you move, mm -hmm. you have to file okay. Form AR-11 informing the government of the change of okay. address within 10 days of moving. Okay. 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 So if you, okay. if you, if you know, forgot to do that or didn't do it and three months have gone by, don't worry about it. Do it now. Okay. Okay. Right. I can do it. Still, right? Yeah. Okay. Don't lose your sleep over it. Um, I don't like to see that happen, mm -hmm. but it's not going to be something government is going to come after you for. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I will do it immediately. Yeah. Okay. Going forward, do it, and you can Thank do you it too. online. It takes less than two minutes to finish the form. Uh huh. Okay. Got it. Got it. Got All it. right. Yeah. I'll do that. Yeah. yeah. Good luck. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye bye. Yeah. Okay, I don't think I have any other frequently asked questions. Now, let me go back to the posted questions that are the routine questions. Okay, non-frequently asked questions. Let's see. So, the first one is, 
H for extension and travel. Impact of December trip on pending approvals and future H for H for EAD. My H for extension approval is due in February. However, I'm re required to visit India in December and return by mid January. Um, does it affect my extension request? So here is here is the way I remember reading this. I was not able to find the source of my memory, but I remember reading. Government said you can travel during any extension application uh, except B two. So like H four EAD, uh, sorry H four. If I travel while the extension is still pending. As long as I have a valid visa when I return, I'm okay. It should not impact my H4 application, but it can delay my EAD. Uh, as a practical matter, I don't think it should. But can I point out to the source of my memory? I cannot. You should call USCIS customer service to confirm or talk to your own lawyers, see if they can find the source of my knowledge, because um, I don't remember off the top of my head. I read a lot every day. Um, I spend an hour, two hours reading every day. So there's no way I can tell you where I read this, but I'm pretty sure that's what the law is. Okay. Star five. If you have a follow up question on what I just talked about, press star five. All right. Next one. Response, responding to validation study. So somebody got an email uh, that it that says it's from the consulate. Okay. Um, I would not answer any questions unless I'm 100% sure it is from an official US, uh, US government source. How do you confirm that? Well, if you are an IT professional, you can do a trace route and look at the uh, source of the information, a uh, source of the email. You can look at the email headers in detail not just the headers that you see in Gmail, but go behind them and see if the email seems to have come from an official source. Even that is not 100% guaranteed. And in any case, this is a request, not a demand. Why do I have to respond to it? I don't have to cooperate with them. Uh, we are doing a validation study on H4 visa. What do I care? You can do your study. I'm not responding to any questions. That's the way I see it. Okay. Star five, if you have a follow-up question. All right, next one, question number six on my board. Um, can I can I do a do-it-yourself I-485 if I have an I-140 approval? Sure, you can do the I-485 yourself as long as you have enough time to read through all the requirements. It isn't difficult to do an I-485. Uh, would I hire a lawyer just to do a 485? No, but if you have more money than time, Hire a lawyer. If you have more time than money, do it yourself. I think it can be done. Star five, if you have a follow-up question. Okay. Ne green card audit concerns. Using college experience for job requirement and considering job switch amid H-1B validity. I'm writing to seek help regarding the possibility of an audit on my green card. As mentioned by my external firm, Fragoman, my company set a one year prior experience when I was hired for the job. I obtained the job without prior experience after this word is a mistake. Exceeding my internship, that's not an English word, must be a spelling mistake somewhere. Oh, it must be excelling. Okay, sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, yeah, I think you got the spelling right. I just didn't expect that word. Excelling in my internship. I was hired in October because of my exceptional performance in my internship. Uh, okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, to summarize, they decided to use my US master's degree for educational qualifications and undergraduate part-time work to fulfill one-year requirement. My question is, should I switch my job? 
I have four years of H one B as I as I might receive an audit. So I don't know your case. This is a very generic question, Sharma ji. I can't really give you an answer. Um, I can give you a generic answer because I don't know your case. I haven't looked at the way the green card was filed. I haven't looked at your experience letters. I haven't compared the two to see if this will work or not. But I can tell you this. First, can we use internship experience as a part of our job requirements? Absolutely. Can we use, uh, let's say I have 20 hours per week experience for two years. Can that be considered to be full time for one year? Absolutely. So it depends. There are too many variables for me to answer this question definitively. I can only hope that your lawyers have done their homework. So if they have done their homework, um, audit and request for more information, RFE, none of that bothers me. As long as the case is prepared well. Okay. Star 5, if you have a follow-up question. I hope the generic information at least helps you. Next question number 8. F1 OPT STEM extension and transition to F1 CPT. Delayed jobs. Oh, there is a follow-up question from area code 347. Okay. 347, where are you? New York. Okay. New York, go ahead, please. New York, I can hear you. Go ahead. Hi, Rajiv, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you, sir. Oh, uh, so yes. Um, thank you, sir, for answering the question and always helping us. Um, but um, I think this question, um, I'll try to summarize it uh, even better so mm -hmm. it, it helps. Um, mm -hmm. So basically, um, the business, which in this case, my company set a requirement that in order for me to get the job, I need to have one year of prior experience, which I did not have it, mm -hmm. but they still hired me. So in H1B, there was no problem. But I think during the time of green card, they have to, uh, the lawyers have to show that that one year experience was obtained mm -hmm. in order for me to actually get the job. Mm -hmm. um, now, this is my first job. They said, if I were to move to a different job, then I can use my existing job experience. Yes. <clears throat> but I cannot use on the job experience. You cannot use the same experience for the same job working for the same employer. So if I joined IBM as a systems analyst with no experience, one year down the line, I cannot file a green card for a systems analyst with one year experience. Okay. But can, it, can I file it as a senior systems analyst? Yeah, probably. So there's a whole lot of ifs and buts there. Very difficult for me to say. But did you have any experience at all when you uh, joined the employer on green card? Um, I had uh, one year of college experiences where I showed that I did the same responsibilities that are required. And I obtained those experience letters from my college employers, mm -hmm. but those were part-time jobs. But and did I they, was, did they get those, uh, all, all, all calculated, did they amount to 2,080 hours of work? Uh, it was one year, so um, it was... So, hang uh, on. Yes, it, hang, was, it was that. Uh, so, Abhiji, <laughs> if it was one year part-time, that doesn't qualify you, again, depends upon the language of the PERM application. But one year part-time is not equal to one year full-time. However, if you had... Was, go ahead. Right. Go ahead. Uh, it was actually multiple years that, <coughs> huh. that they were able to... Then you're okay. Then you're okay. Because if all calculated it comes down to 2080, you should be okay. Okay. You know, what is this 2000, uh, what is this 2000, that? what is this 2080? Simply 52 weeks multiplied by 40 hours. Okay. Okay. So we have one so cases like this. Say there's a possibility. No, no, we have one cases like this. I don't even care about audits. Audits and audits and RFEs are a fact of life. What is the big deal about audits and RFE? They don't bother me. <laughs> okay. So. Okay. As long as the case was prepared so well, not, yeah, as long as the case was prepared well, 
internship, whether part-time or full-time, as long as it amounts to 2080 hours, should be okay. Okay. So, business requirements do matter up to a certain extent, but if the case is built strong, uh, it shouldn't be an issue. So, they proceeded ahead with it. No, uh, but they I, just told I, me that there's a possibility see, of an audit. Like all law firms, you have different levels of talent within the same law firm. So I don't know how good the person looking over your case was. Um, I, I I can't really comment on that. All I can tell you is generically what I know. Okay. Okay. So I shouldn't really worry about switching my job um, because I I, I keep coming back coming back to the same statement over and over again. I don't know your case. I've told you what I know generically. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I appreciate it. Good luck. Okay. Yeah, it's a little difficult to, to, it's like asking a doctor to diagnose a patient without looking at the patient. So don't worry. If it is prepared well, you should be okay. Ask your lawyers to look at it one more time. Okay. So the question was F1, OPT, etc. All right. Let's see. I'm currently on F1 OPT stem extension. EAD expires first week of January. I plan to enroll in a university to continue with another master's. And the uh, first week of January, my current employer does not employ F1. I, this question looks familiar. My current employer does not allow employment of F1 CPT. I am 100% sure I've talked to this gentleman before. Uh, is it fine to start with my master's in January? and not enroll in a day one CPT until I find a job. Sure. I, I am pretty sure. I think you wrote to me on LinkedIn also. And I already responded to you. I told you talk to your DSO. It is perfectly okay to start the course without the CPT. You can't start it mid-semester. That is correct. Yeah. You will not be able to start till the next CPT cycle. Yeah. You'll have to wait. You can discuss it with your, um, with your um, DSO but you would have to wait till the next semester to begin so that it coincides with a course, right? As curricular practical training is tied to a particular course. Whenever you start that course, that's when you start the CPT. Star five, if you have a follow-up question, press star five. All right. We looked at NIW criteria. We looked at grace period. Now the question number 11. Uh, pending EB2 India, 45 interview, chances, timing, safe documentation, porting with own company. Oh my God, that's a lot of questions. Um, company, let's see. My EB2 in India, 45 is pending, 180 days. EAD is approved. Dates will become current in January 24th. Case is ready to be scheduled for an interview. Company A is my 485 green card supporting sponsoring employer, but I now work for company B on EAD. What are the chances there'll be a green card interview? I can't predict that. How soon can I expect the interview to be scheduled? Go to um, any of the search engines like Google, Bing, whatever, and type USCIS processing times, select I-485, select the local office where it will be pending. Okay. So let's say you are in Washington, DC, you'll select Fairfax. You are in um, Washington state, you'll select Seattle, depending upon whichever is the closest sub office and look at their 485 wait times. For example, in North Carolina, it can take up to three years to schedule an interview. Okay. I currently work for my own company. If USA schedules an interview, uh, yeah, you need to you need to definitely talk with your own lawyers because this is a tricky situation and this is your green card, not something I would like to take a chance with. In theory, at least, it is possible to do an AC-21 for your own company. In practice, it's far more complicated than just a simple yes or no. My suggestion, sit down with a lawyer, Spend an hour, half an hour, 45 minutes, go over your case. I'm hoping that you have a lawyer representing you and you did all of this under their guidance. If you did sit with them, work out the details. 
theoretically at least it's perfectly possible to do an AC21 port to your own company. Okay. Star 5, if you have a follow-up question on this, press star 5. Okay, so this one is KC0369, question number 12. A lot of questions about O1A, EB1A. You need to send me your resume. Uh, these are not, this this many questions I can't answer in one, um, one, <laughs> This is, this is like a 15 minute, 20 minute conversation. I won't have that kind of time. You can send me your resume. I can take a look at your resume. Uh, my email is help at immigration.com. And if we have time during that time, you can ask me your questions. We don't charge for a resume review, uh, but we do charge for any questions beyond that 15 minutes. So if you need to schedule a follow-up consultation, we can do that. Star five, if you have a follow-up questions, any follow-up questions? All right. Anyone has any question, press star five. New questions, okay now. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, that's easy. Only five people with questions? No problem. Let's start in the order that you logged in. First one logged in from area code 310, which is California. Let me find you. Show you where is 310. Okay, so I select you and I say select. Okay, area code 310, California. Go ahead, please. Sir, sir uh, happy new year and good afternoon. Good afternoon. Happy new uh, year to I you. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I have emailed you on help at immigration that about my friend. Okay. Like, uh, um, yeah, India, uh, she's India born, mm -hmm. but now, right now, is an Australian citizen. Okay. Will they be able to do the H1, eligible for H1? Uh, you said she's an Australian citizen? Uh, right now, she's an Australian citizen through her husband, but okay. uh, she's Indian born. Yeah, she can do an I E3 visa, which has no quota. Uh, which one, E3? E3 is just like an H1B only. It has no quota. It's much better, thousand times better than H1B. Okay. Okay, E3. Yeah, tell her, the, the, tell her to do, to tell her to do an, person? yeah, tell her to do an E3 visa. E3 visa. And will your, uh, will your company will be able to do the E3 visa? Absolutely. We'll be delighted to help, of course. Okay. Sure. Okay, sir. Okay. Thank just, you. Thank yeah, you. just email me at help at immigration.com. Sure, sure, sir. Okay. Yeah, yeah. E3 visas are wonderful. We love E3 visas. Okay. okay. Thank you, sir. Good luck, sir. Okay, next one is from area code 603, which is New Hampshire. Let me find you, sir. Uh, New Hampshire, go ahead, please. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, this is the first time I'm attending your session mm -hmm. and um, I'm grateful that you've accepted my call. Of course. Our so, pleasure. sir, I have a question. Um, like, I am on my F1 OPT currently mm -hmm. and uh, my friend, he's a U.S. citizen mm -hmm. and uh, he currently he's doing a business with his partner and the company is on his uh, partner's name. So, but he's a U.S. citizen. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to ask if there there's any way he can apply for my green card. Well, uh, what does he do and what do you do, sir? Uh, I am currently working in an IT company, sir. Okay. I'm on my STEM OPT. Does your friend also yes. have an IT company? No. He, uh, he works, I mean, he actually, uh, he and his partner own a jeweler store yeah. in Ohio. I don't see how they can apply um, for you. I don't see how they can apply. Nothing, it has nothing to do with your field. Okay. So is there any, any way that, you know, he can apply uh, for green card? For, I mean, let's suppose... Uh, 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 like, you know, I'm asking if, he, if there is any way he can apply for 
uh, my green card like if i join his business or something yeah, but, like that but it has nothing to do with your background so just joining the business doesn't do anything i don't see how he can apply for your green card there's a mismatch between your degree and his job okay so uh, my degree had to be relevant if he yeah if you have a uh, if you had a degree in gemology i would have said yeah let's let's do it Uh, or he had it. If he had a IT company or a consulting company, I would have said, "Sure, go for it." Okay. Okay. Yeah. Don't make so up on stuff. On the basis of yeah. uh, his business. Yeah. May, don't make up stuff. Always go with the truth, because if any uh, oh. misstatement is found by the government, they will bar you from entering the US forever. You can never come back again. Okay. So be careful with that. All right, all right. So, I mean, it was a general question I had in my mind. Yeah, yeah. No, no. If there is, a, if there is a, so much yeah, me. if there is a background match, then definitely they can do it. All right. Okay. Okay. Understood. Good luck, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Let me go to Massachusetts, which is area code six one seven. Six one seven. Go ahead, please. Hello, sir. um happy new year happy new year my also first time in now attending your okay. call good so i am an it professional working on opt with a reputed consulting firm oh good okay and we work for various clients okay now we are apply, i am applying for stem opt okay. and while applying for stem mm-hmm. we are required to mention the working site in mm-hmm. form i983 training mm-hmm. form mm-hmm. so my question is Uh, in the training from my employer has mentioned the client location as the work site okay. so now can we mention a client location yeah, in i, I think i think this case is this case is quite complicated why because remember in training the company that is doing your training is responsible for it so unless they have their own manager on site with the client to whom you report and who supervises you they cannot even file the training form for you okay okay so okay but they have my manager has signed and you know already filed it so yeah. i don't i'm here and here yeah that's that's if if lawyer, so I, yeah if the government takes issue with that they will deny the um, opt okay All right. All right, sir. Thank you so much. I you would, welcome. So I would maybe uh, ask your help if of uh, course. offline or of for course. further consultation. No problem at all. Good luck to you. Thank you. You're welcome. Let's see. Florida is next. Area code eight one three. Yeah, Florida. Go ahead. Area code eight one three. Go ahead, please. Happy New Year and good morning, uh, sir. Happy New Year, Ji, and good afternoon. We are both on the East Coast, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. So, so my question is, um, I have an employer who mm-hmm. I uh, I got transferred last year on H one. Mm hmm. Uh, so my and uh, I had camping done last year on September twenty twenty uh twenty twenty two. Okay. And my camping is valid until May twenty. Five. And you said you have an H one B visa. Hold on, you said you have an H one B, right? Correct. H1. Okay. Yeah. Keep going. I got yes, it. Sir. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. H one. Mm-hmm. So H one, it it is like a transfer that happened last year, mm-hmm. and uh, my employer initiated I one forty process all the way from P W D and advertisement and everything in the twenty twenty two October. And within the series of events, he filed labor in September twenty uh, September twenty three, mm-hmm. like four months before. Mm-hmm. And now the situation is that my company is going little tough with the budgeting and issues. So mm-hmm. they have a company in India as well. So on the contrary, they don't want to leave us. They don't want to fire us. Rather, they put up a uh, option saying that if I, if we want to go back and work in India for a very little time from where between 4 to 10 months mm-hmm. so that it would give us a time to upskill our upskill ourselves in other expertise and come back with mm-hmm. full mm-hmm. full scope of hitting the market mm-hmm. and during the process they told 
about even if I'm in India, they're gonna do my I-140 or the form application that would be uh, once the labor result is out, mm-hmm. another two months or three months, mm-hmm. they would be willing to do uh, the um, mm-hmm. uh, I-140 application. Mm-hmm. So I have been hearing that we should we should stay within the US and have the US payrolls in order for you to do the form. So I'm a little confused about that part. Okay. Whether so. So let me let me clarify that for you. Okay. Where you are located is irrelevant. Whether you are in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, China, Japan, I don't care. Your green card can still go on if two things remain unshaken. Number one, the company has enough money to pay you. Okay, that's called ability to pay wages. That's your, you should talk to your lawyers uh, about that. Number one. Uh, I'm sorry to stop you. I, I just want to answer this particular question before I forget. So when I checked with the attorneys of my company, they told that their schedule L, financials are doing great and it should not be a hindrance okay. in any so, so I can't really comment about that it's because I am not the attorney. So, <laughs> so that's it's the right. number one requirement. Number two requirement is... Mm-hmm. There is no break in the continuity of the job. The job must continue to exist. Okay. So I'll give you an example. There was a sale of a hotel. That hotel had 50 green cards filed. The new company, they bought the hotel and they said, look, we are going to close down the hotel for one month. We are firing the whole staff, but we'll hire you back once the renovations are done. Okay, the government said all green cards are cancelled because for one month you, there was no job. You get my point? I got it. I got it. So if the jobs continue so, to exist, the I one forty can go on, no problem. Your location doesn't matter. So, so here the thing is, my job. It will be terminated in years, but no, it's not your job. It is the job. So let's say your job okay. is systems analyst. So they terminated your job, but the job of systems analyst continued to exist for them. No problem. This is a question your lawyer should decide for um, you, not you. Okay. All so right. With respect to that, they have an answer saying that uh, because my employment. No, don't give me the answer. Now, Talk to your lawyers about it, sir. <laughs> This is not something I can deal with. This is a very specific issue, very specific question. Depends upon the facts of the case, which your lawyers and your employer know, not I. Okay? I understand. I understand. Thank you. Thank you so much. You are welcome. But this can be done. This is done all the time. I must have done a thousand cases like this. Remember, I have been practicing (laughs) for 33 years. There's nothing I haven't done. Okay? And yet, every day I learn something new. That's the sad part. You never understand everything. <laughs> All right. True, true. Good true. luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sir. You're welcome, sir. Thank you. Mm, bye bye. Massachusetts, area code 774. Go ahead, please. Hello, sir. Hello, ma'am. Uh, my friend discussed my uh, issue with, uh, like, uh, in this call itself. Mm-hmm. I just have a small tweak in that. All right. So I have a pay- paycheck which I got on November 14th. Okay. okay? Mm-hmm. The company's pay cycle is n- n- October 23 to November 5. Okay. Okay? okay. But I was only paid till 10, uh, November, sorry, October 23 till October 31st. Okay. And the, for the last four, five days, I was not paid. Yeah. So does that mean my last day was 31st? Or November 5th or November 14th? Uh, October 31st, because that was the pay period that was covered. So, if it was October 31st, then I am already overstaying for four days now. Yes, ma'am, so you are. What are my options? Not very many. Um, what you should do, you have a job offer already or no? No. Okay. Well, look. Um, You can try this. Uh, It's a little dangerous because remember, once you start accruing unlawful presence, 
one eighty yeah. days of unlawful presence makes you ineligible to come back mm-hmm. to USA for three years. Okay. Right. And if you have unlawful mm-hmm. presence of one year, you can't come back for ten years. Right. So what you have to do is you have to make sure you can apply for a B one B two. Make a request to the government to give you status because uh, you screwed up. I would say get a lawyer, let them do it for you. As long yeah. as you leave oh, USA, I, hold on, let me finish. Mm-hmm. As long as you leave USA within one eighty days, even if you leave on the one seventy ninth day, there should be no permanent damage mm-hmm. to you. Okay, so okay. and let go ahead. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, was there any other option as well? No. No, well, the other option is to go home and wait there until you get another H one B job and come back on H one B. Right. So let's say I go back again because if I file B two now and the B two process would take time, and in that time, if I did not secure my H one H one B again with another employer, then I would be overstaying for a longer time, which I do not want to do in. Unlawful presence. Well, so unlawful presence of less, ma'am. Well, unlawful presence of one eighty days has no consequence. Okay, the only consequence it might have mm-hmm. is in the future if you want to do a tourist visa or an or a student visa, you would have a problem. But for H one B, L one green card, that's not a problem. So let's say if I have a consultancy waiting for me and they are willing to give me an offer tomorrow. And I ask them to file my H one B transfer. Will they be able to do that? Yeah. What I would do is, if if the consultancy company asked me, I would say, file the H one B, okay, file the H one B, and ask the government to forgive your your mistake. File it premium processing. Hundred percent that case mm-hmm. will be decided within one eighty days. If the government forgives you, great, mm-hmm. we celebrate. If they don't forgive you, go get a visa stamp and come back. No issue. Okay, so in that case, I have a job. I have my H one B. I just have to go back to India. No, uh, not India. India. Why do? You, why does India? everybody keep running back to India? You you can go to Costa Rica, Jamaica, Mexico, Canada, any country outside uh, around here. Okay, any country get it stamped mm-hmm. and get back here on H one. No problem. Okay. And I have another question. So, mm-hmm. because I have overstayed for these four or five days, mm-hmm. and let's say I do not have any employer to uh, do my H one transfer, mm-hmm. I go back to India. I mm-hmm. secure an H one B from India, mm-hmm. and I come here. Mm-hmm. If I am not able to secure an H one B then, even in India, and I want to come on B two, will they be creating any problem? Because no, you can problems? always tell them how complicated your circumstances were. Because you had these three, four dates mm-hmm. floating around, and by the time you talked to a lawyer, it mm-hmm. was already too late. So you ran home as quickly as you could. They are probably going to, they're not going to look upon it negatively. I think they'll be happy that you at least tried your best. I think you'll be all right. Yeah, because my company HR and attorney, mm-hmm. they are still saying that because I was paid on eleventh of. Uh, November, sorry, 14th of November. Mm-hmm. I, my date is 14th of November, and well, uh, my seventh um, day I got on December 26th. I have to so, look at uh, the, the company uh, ma'am. Day. One second, I mm-hmm. have to look at the exact language mm-hmm. that the government used in the um, in the notice that they sent out saying that we will count the pay period. Uh, in my opinion, it is the mm-hmm. pay period, not the pay date, that matters. But I don't remember the exact okay. language. You can have your lawyers review it and review it yourself because this language is available on the web. It's not a hidden document. Yeah, I can I request you to be my lawyer. Well, ma'am, if the company has already has a lawyer, we can do a consultation for you. How about that? Just go ahead and send me an email. Yes. Send me an email to help at immigration dot com. We'll do a consultation yes. for you. And I'll record the call so you can play it for your lawyers and your employer. Yeah, the the urgency is if technically if we come up with a with a uh, conclusion that eleventh uh, uh, of November is my last day, like my start date, then today is technically okay. my last day. Okay. So hold on one so, second. Hold on one second. Wait here. Yeah. 
I don't need to charge you for this. It will just take me five minutes. What I'll do is, this call is already being recorded. Mm -hmm. uh, let me take this call okay. from North Dakota. Uh, you'll be the last call of the day. I can spend a couple of minutes, take a quick look at what the uh, language of the law says. Okay. So hold on one second. Okay. Just stay on the line. Okay. Sorry. Let me take the, uh, the second last call. Uh, North Dakota, go ahead, please. Area code 701. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead, please. Yeah, so actually I'm not from North Dakota. It's a fake number. Anyways, uh, uh, I was the one who asked the NIW question from Canada. Yeah, I'm writing writing it up actually. As we speak, I'm almost 80% yeah, done so with it. I was the, just wondering, quick yeah. question. When you write about it, can you write a little bit more about the exceptional ability specifically? Um, that's actually a lot about exceptional that ability. Is, that is way beyond the scope of my article, but I can tell you where to look for it. Okay. If you send me an email, okay, you if you thing? send me an email to help at immigration.com and say, Rajiv, I talked to you okay. today about exceptional ability under NIW, send me the link. I'll send you a link to where all the information is. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes. No problem at all. Yes. Okay. You're welcome. All right. Thank you so much. Bye. Yes, sir. You're welcome. Okay, ma'am, are you still here? Let me see. Um, where are you? Can you raise your hand again? Star five me, please. I can't see you. Oh, there you are. I see you now. Okay. So let's take a quick look uh, at the law. Okay. Let me go to my notes. Yeah. I have it saved somewhere. Give me one second. H1 law regulation. I have actually shared my paste up to you on LinkedIn. No, I don't need to see the paste up. I just need to see okay. what the law is. You can take it to your lawyers. Bonus as salary, da, 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 da. travel, revocation, change of status, AC21, regulations, memos and policies. Damn, dude, where did I save it? Okay. I have over three terabytes of text information in my notes. Sometimes it becomes impossible to look for things. Hold on. Revocation, travel, uh, ta, 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 ta. cap exempt H-1Bs, client letters, H-1B bonus as wages, peripatetic, sample, sample, RSK notes, here we go. RSK notes, uh, ta, 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 ta. LCA decisions, H-4, oh, I didn't save it for some reason. I'll just find the information. Give me one second. Um, options. Do you have a um, uh, Do you have a computer in front of you, ma'am? Yes. Okay. In the search bar, type options for yes. H1B laid off USCIS. Options for H-1B laid off USCIS. Click on that. Mm -hmm. And as you scroll down, there is a uh, USCIS newsroom alert options. Mm, that's one. And let's see. Let's click on that. And I think that's the one we want to look at. Yeah, 60 day grace period. That's the link. So the first government oh. link which is uscis.gov newsroom alerts options da, da, da. that's the one you want are you there yeah i am there you uh, but i do not see that what do you mean you do not see that so i have i am on you options for non immigrant working no no don't don't do, did you do a search oh in the search i should say options for no. Yeah, so options H1B. for H-1B laid off USCIS. Do that. EIS. Okay, yes. Uh, options for H-1B working. Oh, options. For... There should be a government well, website. What, what... It, it, it says options for non-immigrant workers following termination. You see that? Yes, that's the one. The first link yes. that says USCIS.gov newsroom alerts that's the one you want. Yes. Okay, go there. Okay. Let's see. Yeah. Let's see. 
change of status uh, adjustment period of authorized stay expedite departure maybe that's not the one hold on uh, 60 day grace period okay mm. Yeah, it's always difficult. I I thought I had saved the link somewhere, but I'm still looking. Give me mm -hmm. one second. Because they, they specifically talked about it. Uh, during this period, maybe if, if a new employer timely files a petition. Portability to a new employer, change of status. Change of status, just period of authorized stay. Hmm. All right. I'm going to another page. Yes, this is the page. So at the bottom of that page, very bottom, mm -hmm. there's a link. The above information is now available on our new options for non-immigrant workers following termination. You see that? That. Go mm -hmm. to that link. That has some that. some accordion text, right? You see the accordion text? Mm -hmm. I think it's in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. Give me one second. I'll find it for us. Maximum 60 day grace period. Okay. Let's click on the first okay. accordion page. When does the 60 day grace period start? That's the second question, okay? Mm -hmm. It says the maximum 60 day period starts the day after termination of employment, which is determined based on the last day for which the salary or wage, wage is paid. Last day for which the salary or wage is paid. See what I'm saying? So it's the mm -hmm. pay period, not the pay date. Okay? You can show it to your uh, lawyers. Okay, so your lawyers are wrong. So technically, it's so technically it's ten thirty one. Yeah, because that's the pay, that that's the period for which you received the salary. Right, and uh, I have overstayed for four days. So yes, ma'am. My best option is that I go back, I go back, I secure an H one B there, mm -hmm. and then come here. Yes, ma'am. Or if. If by tomorrow or day after tomorrow I find an H one B who would who is willing to do my transfer, like a consultancy is willing to do my transfer, mm -hmm. uh, I would do it in premium process. Yeah, I would certainly try that if I were you. All right. Okay. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Bye bye. Bye. All right, folks. That does it for today. I'll see you again next Thursday. And this time it will be on LinkedIn. Take care, everyone. Great talking to you. Bye-bye.